Thank you for listening to Scandinavian Crimes Podcast. Be sure to check out the episode links and be part of our other social media platforms where you can leave a topic suggestion or even share some of your insights regarding the subject matter of the episode. We will always do our best to provide a well-researched episode, but sometimes due to limited access to information and translation issues, some information can be lost. It is therefore good to do your own research and get a deeper understanding of a case of your own interest. So with that all said, let us start today's episode. Welcome to Scandinavian Crimes. My name is Devante and say hello to my co-host Delilah. Hi. And on this podcast, we will cover famous Scandinavian criminals who made their mark throughout Scandinavian history. Okay, so today we're in for a doozy. Well, a very interesting case, at least in my opinion. This one, forgive me if I butcher this, uh, is Juka Torsten Lindholm. Um, also known as Michael Maria Pentholm and currently Michael Patilla. Uh, like I said, I don't know how the names are supposed to be pronunciated because it's a Finnish, I believe, name. So uh, just bear with me here. According to the Finnish crime magazine, she is the only Finn who fits the FBI's description of a true serial killer. There are true criterias in which you have to kind of, you know, fit in order for you to be identified as the FBI's, you know, true definition of a serial killer. She considered herself a lesbian woman since approximately 2009. Despite her danger, Lindholm has repeatedly been released, even with the risk of new death by her hands, and has been subject to much criticism from the people over how lackadaisical and how chill functioning the Finnish legal system seems to be, especially in regards to her. For the sake of the story, though, I will refer to her by her original name so that way everyone can consistently keep up with the story instead of all the bouncing around and getting the names confused. So this is a story of Juka Lindholm. Despite not knowing too much about Juka Lindholm's younger years prior to the age of 16, she had shown signs of trouble even in her adolescence. Back in November 1981, at the age of 16, she kidnapped a 15-year-old girl and forced her into a basement where she beat her, choked her with scarves, and threatened to rape her. She wore black leather gloves during the attack. The girl managed to escape, and despite the 16-year-old Lindholm receiving no fines, earlier thefts and attacks led her to the Carava Youth Facility in 1984 to be later released in 1985. Despite going to the youth facility, this was only the beginning of her criminal career. Lindholm killed her mother, 48-year-old burn maid Lena Lindholm, in her apartment in Ulu on August 26, 1985. Both Lindholm and her mother's male friend was suspected of the murder, however, it was initially ignored. The next murder Lindholm committed was July 26, 1986. She met two 12-year-old girls downtown and persuaded them to come to her apartment so she could lend them a few marks for alcohol. Within the residence in Ulu, she locked one of the girls in the bathroom. The other girl was knocked down on the floor and choked to death. After some time, Lindholm released the other girl from the bathroom and sexually assaulted her. The girl escaped her grasp and ran from the apartment to the stairway while Lindholm fled to the nearby forest where the police soon caught her. She was drunk with a 1.75 on the BAC scale. In connection with the murder, Lindholm confessed to the police that she was mistreated by her mother. According to her statement, she had worn blue leather gloves and the red colored scarf of her mother before doing the murder. She was angered by the fact that her mother had not been there to release her from the youth facility and she had been dating a new man and preferred living with him rather than her father. Later in Ulu court, she recanted her confession and claimed that she had been using multiple psychoactive drugs at once. The Ulu district court issued a judgment on March 17, 1987. The court ruled that Juka Lindholm had been guilty of two charges of manslaughter, as well as other crimes, condemning her to nine years and seven months imprisonment. However, the appellate court held the case of Lena Lindholm's death was not a murder and instead an assault or negligent homicide and reduced the sentence to seven years imprisonment. Lindholm was granted parole in May 1992. 
On May 31st, 1993, she had choked a 42-year-old woman with a cloth belt in her Kempel apartment. Lindholm at first objected sharply to the act, claiming that somebody had set her up. On June 23rd, 1993, she escaped from Ulu County Police Station with a man. The Ulu District Court considered Lindholm to be completely sane and sentenced her to nine and a half years imprisonment on December 13th, 1993. Following the judgment of the district court, Lindholm contacted the investigators. She admitted to having killed a woman, but it was only an accident. According to her, she had proposed explicit sex and explained that she was playing around the neck before realizing the woman had died due to choking. Lindholm had wandered off her mother's grave after murdering, staying there for a few hours. The appellate court subsequently changed the sentence to 10 and a half years, sending Lindholm to a special institution. According to psychiatric reports, Lindholm admired the primordial violent manhood of her teenage years. Despite starting to wear dresses and women's underwear while in prison, the head of the center forbade this and Lindholm subsequently complained to the parliament's higher ups. Lindholm was released on parole in November 2008. Prior to her release, she was subjugated to treatment, which came to the conclusion that she was not yet ready for civilian life. In prison, she married Hanel Pentholm, who was sentenced to life imprisonment for her husband's murder. They were married for a couple years. Since then, she renamed herself Michael Maria Pentholm, who invited a woman to her house in May 2009. There, she tried to choke the woman with both her hands from behind. So this next part is really crazy. This shows how wild and out of control she was even after she had already served her prison time. So sit back for this one because this one is a doozy. Even though the story is not super long, hear the succession of events that happened after she was released time and time again. And this is where the complaints came from. In 2009, Pence Home brought an Ulu apartment via a professional jury magazine announcement. She began to choke a woman who was erecting a message table in the apartment's living room. A third such case occurred in September 2009. Pentome had ordered a cleaner for the apartment and began to choke her, but she managed to escape and immediately alert the police. On June 11, 2010, the Ulu District Court sentenced Pinholm to six years imprisonment for the attempted manslaughter and numerous assaults. Authorities ordered Lindholm to sit through her whole entire sentence because according to the mental study, she was regarded as a very dangerous offender. In April 2011, the appellate court considered Lindholm to have committed only three aggravated assaults, lowering the sentence to four years and five months. At the same time, the court ruled that the prerequisites for ordering Pentome to sit out her punishment as a whole in jail did not exist. On March 2nd, 2012, the district court condemned Lindholm for four years and four months for a serious rape, gross ill treatment, and false imprisonment. The cruel rape and false imprisonment had taken place on August 21, 21st to 22nd in 2009 at a hotel in Ulu, and the assault in the company in the period of May 1st to May 31st, 2009 in Lindholm's Ulu's apartment. The authorities ordered Lindholm to execute her full sentence in jail, and the appellate court upheld the verdict in October 2012. On Tuesday, October 13, 2015, Lindholm, now renamed Michael, escaped from Lucas Open Prison during a prisoner shopping trip but was caught the following day. She was granted parole in spring of 2016. Lindholm's jail sentence was prolonged due to the absences of the entire term of her sentence was changed to imprisonment in a closed prison system. Lindholm was released in 2016 on Christmas. In April 2017, the police ordered Lindholm to be arrested again for an alleged aggravated crime and the preparation of a criminal offense, but the Helensky District Court released her during the investigation. In May 2017, the Helensky Appellate Court annulled the decision and Lindholm was arrested. On July 7, 2017, the Alinsky, the Alinsky District Court dismissed the prosecution of an aggravated criminal offense or the health offense and ordered Lindholm to be released. In May 2018, the appellate court changed the decision and Lindholm was sentenced to two years and six months in prison and to pay the victim compensation of 4,000 euros. On April 13th, 2018, Lindholm killed a sex worker in Halinski apartment. The victim was found on May 4th and Lindholm was arrested two days later in Halinski, suspected of murder. 
On May 17, 2018, the police announced that Lindholm had admitted during interrogation that she had committed a homicide. In July, the Helensky District Court sentenced her to life imprisonment for murder. She had held steady discretion in the murders using several tools such as a leather belt and her bare hands. Lindholm later announced that she would appeal the court's decision. This was an absolute roller coaster in this last section because this was a huge miscarriage of justice. Like from the beginning of the story, they ignored the fact that her mom was killed until she got caught up at a later point for some other charges. But even then, I don't think she was officially charged. Um, everything like is I get like I said, I understand that, especially in Scandinavia in general, but I get it in Finland. They have really low crime rates. But when you have situations like this with people like this who they are driven by sexual desires and what we would call them sexual sadists, you know, a lot of her desires were sexual based, especially the attachment she had to, you know, this rage and, you know, her sexual identity and how it actually played a part into her murders. Um, it was, it's just out of control. They needed to do something different and they refused to do something different. They kept repealing and, you know, letting her go out on parole. And she like literally multiple years she's been killing or aggravating assault. Like just it is so I'm honestly flustered because there's so many things that just keeps happening back to back to back to back. And it's like they just refuse to do anything different about the situation. And I have no idea why it's frustrating because like this, this is someone who was killing people these or even in some cases attempting to kill people these people have families and yet you're still willing to just let this person walk away and you're not fixing the problem you know you're i don't even think of this person at least i didn't see anything that they were getting some sort of help while they were in prison this is someone who should not be out in public even in one case when they actually released her and they said she should not be out they still released her and then immediately went to go kill someone like it's what is going on here and this is recent literally 2018 was not that long ago 2018 was just a few years ago and that was just what two years before the pandemic kicked in which means you know there's a chance that Lynn Holm might come out <laughs> they might do the same thing and then we're going to have some serious issues. So I understand the outrage because this is ridiculous. Um, and just to kind of explain myself when I say like a sexual, like like someone who is like a sexual sadist, for example. Um, so I'm, I'm basically going to give you a definition of what a sexual sadist is when it comes to like serial killers or people like this. So usually sexual sadist is like a physical or someone who is psychologically suffering and like somehow the killing gives them some sort of uh, stimulation sexually in relation to their uh, to the killings. So like in her case, she was strangling people, um, especially because, you know, she, she especially targeted young girls. So we knew that she was lesbian. Her she had a type. She really had a type in terms of she liked young girls and I'm pretty sure some of it had to do with she could not physically take on a grown man or even a teenage boy um you know body different um body difference in terms of strength but she had a type though she didn't even consider going after you know other men or boys she had a type so we knew she was into girls just from the case alone but there seems to be some sort of satisfaction from it because she always seems to strangle she always seems to use these scarves that are linked to her mother. So the the whatever weird attachment she had to her mom, she then translates it into not only her sexual identity, but the way she executes these crimes. So and at least in my opinion, she definitely not only is a serial killer, but she fits the serial killer sexual sadism. And she, she fits in that category because of how she chose to you know, execute that crime, whether it be, you know, using ropes, chains, handcuffs, imprisonment, binding, spanking, whipping, be beating, and then the actual rape of a couple victims. She is by definition a sexual sadist and just the pleasure of the humiliation, because I'm pretty sure it has to do something with her humiliation. That is a foundation of why she gets pleasure. 
And that happens to some people where sometimes they get pleasure from the humiliation. But I'm, I'm ranting. I'm ranting this because this is all over the place. Just let me know, Delilah, the, the what do you think about this? Because I could talk about this all day. You already know I went to school for stuff like this. I can talk about this literally all day. Let me get your opinion about it. So uh, this was a very like this was a very basic, I guess, serial killer story. Um, and there's a couple of things that I want to discuss. Like, we could start off with how everything started as she was a teenager. So, uh, she was using substances, and uh, according to what was stated, she also had some psycho psychotic uh, kind of drugs as well. And she also had some alcohol and avail that was avail available to her uh, since, like, te her teenage years. Um, and... She also had this very like violent and also this almost addictional sex drive. Um, and I just was thinking about like, I wonder if this is a fetish thing or if this is genetics because there have been studies regarding uh, that certain preferences or things that you get aroused by um, when it comes to sex. Is could be ha or have a genetic or like components in your genes. So, um, and I was thinking about that. I was like, because not all teenage be like, oh, this is like, I like violence and kidnapping and stuff, because that was like, she was 15, right? And um, I was just like, H how and where and what, like, why? Even though she might have been intoxicated and stuff, I, I don't think that teenagers, like, they don't usually just go ra like Rambo this way. And it sounded like she didn't really have the best situation with the parents either. Um, but it didn't really say that the mom was mean. It was more like she she did have a boyfriend or like a man that she liked and the and it was then, a separation situation. Yeah, it was a separation situation. There was another man involved. It didn't seem like, or it wasn't noted in anywhere that they had any malice or any anything against Lindholm. It seemed like she just didn't like the situation. So there was like, there's a lot of things that might uh, have triggered this, um, but you know. You can't really know the mind of a serial killer um, fully, especially when it doesn't seem like it was anything that started anything. She just basically, as a teenager, kidnapped and kept doing the same thing and just never learned that that was not a good thing. Or maybe she did understand, but she just didn't care, you know? And she just kept going with it because that was what she liked. She got aroused by the violence and stuff. Um, um, but I guess I'll say this. Mm. Uh, so I know you're diving into the part about the genetics, and I did mention it before, you know, before you started talking. But um, so she fits the category on the FBI as someone who's being like a sexual sadist. Mm. Now, a sexual sadist is someone who gets pleasure from humiliation, from terror, and it's actually a full-blown disorder. So basically, oh, okay. it's a little bit more detailed than like a, you know, a fetish thing. I wonder it's a situation if they, where they, that's what she got the medication for, that maybe she got diagnosed early. I don't think so. It was it, it wasn't like psychotic medication. It was like psychoactive medication. So oh, that could be anything okay. from like mushrooms. Oh, well, I'm just giving an example. Okay, 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 okay. sorry. So anything I thought, that fits okay. a category of mushrooms that then, alter your perspective. Yeah, 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 okay. So, um, but yeah, in her case, she was a sexual sadist. So she got pleasure from causing other people distress, uh, terror, humiliation. And it's kind of sitting on the spectrum of like, you know, being uh, in terms of you know, some of the traits that serial killers and, you know, other potential serial killers can have, you know, like a, um, like being psychotic or having personality disorders mm. or having a, being a sociopath or a psychopath, all that stuff. Like it's on that spectrum where sometimes, you know, serial killers can have one or more of these things 
where they cause them to not being able to rationalize their feelings or their sexual tension because you saw like early when she was younger like you said when she was like around 16 17 when the um, hormones and everything she started she was she just, lesbian like, basically yeah. did whatever she felt like right and that's usually when that disorder kicks in when you're mm. puberty um, and during puberty when your hormones are like full-blown exploding and then you latch on to whatever your sexuality is you know obviously with men if you're a straight man you're going to latch on to women and then you do these uh very sadistic behaviors mm. on women but in her case she was a lesbian um who later turned i believe into she wanted to identify as a man but i think even in the court system they didn't allow her to do that because she was too dangerous but oh. nonetheless she was a woman at the time of 17 to uh she was lesbian hmm. so she did that to other women and the first girl managed to escape because in terms of physicality that's another woman so your chances of escaping another woman is far more likely than obviously escaping a man but because like the point is i was thinking also so, like she did it mostly to younger people too right and i wonder if she did i think it, there was only like one or two instances yeah yeah so like, i was wondering if she did it because it was easier or if she did it for like or it like it didn't matter as long as it was a female or what like or a girl uh like i i just thought about that too i was like there was there didn't seem to be like as soon as long as it was a woman or a girl it, it didn't matter yeah basically yeah, it's more about the yeah the fact that it's a girl yeah that's where her sexual sadism latched on to mm. it's just a convenient thing that you know in younger girls cases it's easier mm. but also she she was a woman at the time as well so basically either way you know the chances of escape are still much higher with her because you know you finding another woman your strength, unless she's a bodybuilder, your strength is still comparable relative. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's the, the reason why the girl was able to escape the 16 year old girl who she had trapped in the basement. Um, mm -hmm. She was able to actually escape and that's how she got found out. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's pretty much how she constantly got caught in a couple situations as well. Um, just some of the, her victims being able to stand a chance against her physically. And uh, I, I would say that saved their lives. But, like I said, outside of the point, sexual sadism, that's what she's classified under. Um, basically, it's a disorder. And uh, if you see these behaviors in people, in general, this goes out to the audience. And that uh, basically means mindful. that they like to hurt. Like, yeah. Is it that for, isn't that a form of, what's it called? B... What, masochism or something like that? <laughs> no, like the, you know that um, BDSM? Like, wait, uh like yes and no okay so it does have like similar criteria but like you know the humiliation but it's one is with consent obviously your partner obviously, wants yeah. it they enjoy it so in the sadistic and also one, two, there's no like consent to it like they just like i don't care about yeah they just do it okay yeah and then there's no there's no line in bdsm and stuff like that you typically if you're going to go extreme there is a safe word so you know when to stop Sexual sadism, sadism is all about I'm never going to stop until I'm satisfied. So everything uh, is against her will. But why can't she just be happy with the... Like, there, there is a safer one. And then she could just find a partner. She did find a partner eventually, which I, you know... But she always would do dumb stuff. Yeah, but like, I mean... Well, you know, it's... I guess she wanted the real deal. And... uh <laughs> it's a disorder. I don't know. It's like, just about the real deal. I don't. It's a legitimate disorder. Yeah. It's like a self-control disorder, but it's more latched onto the sexual aspect of it. Mm. This is interesting. I just like I never knew, like w that it had like there was a disorder like this. But you know, you live and learn. Um, and uh, so regarding also the thing that you said before that they. Um, she was caught a couple of times and went, she went to jail a couple of times throughout her life. I just thought about why didn't they properly evaluate her before releasing her? Like, I know that most Scandinavian countries, they, they do have a lot of, you know, pros and cons when it comes to the justice system. Um, 
They do believe that people can, after some time in jail, get out to society and, you know, um, work things out and uh, rehabilitate that way. And sometimes, or most of the time, it does work. There, we do have like a low uh, crime rate in most of the countries here. But when it comes to serious matters, like like a situation like this, where criminals repeat the same uh, crimes over and over again, I feel like there's a hole in the system where, and it's also weak for those who have a tendency to actually redo the same crime. And the max you can have for like life uh, imprisonment is uh, 12 years usually. Um, and then after that, you can be monitored and stuff. But it's still like, I feel like they didn't really properly evaluate her and like, you know, in a way that I think could have made sure that there was a lot more people being alive today. Um, I just felt like this is a huge hole in the system that also many people have, not only in the countries, in the Scandinavian countries, but also outside, have mentioned that the, they are very weak, like the, the justice system here, and that situation like these where the person does commit the same crime again uh, is basically like they're they're using the system. And uh, I'm actually quite sad about this because special cases like this does exist. And I feel like they just, you know, getting overlooked. Um, they could have saved so I mean, many I people personally... here. Like, honestly, like, there's so, like, she did, like, every time she, she also escaped and everything, right? Like, every time she got outside, she did something. I mean, me personally, uh, I guess on one thing I want to always drive home on every episode, every episode I can, is that the just the criminal justice system in any country is not black and white, where I always use a contrast, because, you know, obviously I'm from the U.S., um, we have one of the more extreme justice systems where, and also the very prejudiced, but, you know, let's not get into that. Um, we have one of the more extreme uh, justice systems where, um, in a lot of cases, a life sentence can literally mean for the rest of your life. You can be 20 and then you can be in prison until the day you die. It's entirely possible and it's not unheard of. Um, and, you know, depending on your circumstances, um, yeah, you can get parole, but, you know, I'm just saying in general. But then, like she said, in Scandinavian countries where a life sentence can just be, you know, a sh not a short amount of time, but compared to you guys, it's to short, shorter. Life, yeah. 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 Relative to like life expectancy where people expect to live to about like 77, 80, you still have some life to live after. Yeah. And some and people do like, just fine. Like they actually don't yeah. commit a crime after that and like trying to live a, a better life, you know. I just think, for me personally, in my mind, I think the most optimal criminal justice system is a situational criminal ju criminal justice system. Yes. Where nothing should be treated as a blanket mm -hmm. where, okay, this works most times, but then, you know, you're going to have those few outliers. And, or in my case, where I live in the U.S., where they will over-prosecute you because prisons make money and people end up in situations where, you know, they don't. They can't go back into society and be productive and then they recommit crimes again. There needs to be a system where everything is situational. There are some factors that need to be taken into account. First, above all else, should definitely be their psychological profile. Yes. Um, you know, make sure they're not crazy. Make sure they're not. And you know, also they don't be have any properly disorders. monitored like, after their release. Like, I think that's also very important. I don't think they did yeah, that. Like, uh, I, I think... Like, it didn't mention anything about them doing a proper evaluation or anything. Uh, yeah. So. so, it just, this the world is does not exist in black and white. There's a lot of shades of gray. And I think all criminal justice systems need to apply that concept to how they practice law and how they enforce it. Because 
some law, some some crimes are really well, most crimes that are com- committed in any developed country, for the most part, are petty crimes, mm. theft, and usually stuff like that is in response to a need, which is they're usually poor, which means you need more community systems in which they're able to get themselves back on their feet because we all know globally we're all of us are feeling it, you know, so that can that can happen. And you have some instances where, let's say someone does kill somebody, there there should be factors that are in place that are taking into consideration the situation. It could be self-defense. It could be uh, some people really do have, you know, bad emotional instability that maybe went undiagnosed and people can lose control of their feelings. Am I saying what they did was right excusable? No. no. But also you need to take into effect that, you know, mental health is a thing as well emotions can alter mental health your environment Mm -hmm. can alter mental health there are a lot of things that can change someone's behavior that are external factors that are not unfortunately considered at least not on the nuanced level in a criminal justice system and that needs to be considered across the planet so i will say it every episode you know if i can just we need to do better in general to make sure we are taking care of people who need the help but also dealing with people like this who are dangerous to other people who were allowed like when in there are prison. special cases like this i think it's yeah. very important to especially if there's history of repeating the same crime i think it's very like you have to really take that into account and monitor that person then um they do i do they have exactly. some type like they do they do monitor in with an extended time uh, it's like, but it's now. But back in the, I don't know, what time was this? Like this happened during like the eighties up till uh, two thousand eight. Like how long was this going on? This whole like everything. Oh, this case. Yeah, everything. Like everything. Uh, yeah, this one was going on for a really long time. Uh, the last update was, I think, what, 2018, actually. Yeah, Even, 1980 yeah. so to like, 2018. That is a, what, that's a 38-year period? Yeah, of repeating the same thing over and over again. And also including her time being in jail. She was there for nine years. It got extended to 11 years. Uh, and like there was, like, she did sit a long time. But also some of those uh, some of those years, like the one with I think eleven, when she served eleven, I think she only served like seven or eight of them. She, yeah, that's what I'm was, saying. Like they there was gave a her times some... where she was not sitting. Exactly. She she they gave her releases and like, and during those releases she did horrible things too. Like there was a couple of times mm-hmm. they just like that's what I was like. I was like, you have you have seen her repeat the crimes. Why are you do- still trying to help her out? Like, monitor her therapy, uh, psychotherapy sessions, uh, you know. I don't know how to really treat that disorder, the sadistic um, disorder that you mentioned. Um, But I think that now, during recent years, they probably have something. So they... Like, I don't think they'd probably had that, like, in the early 2000s or beginning of, like, before t- the 2000s. But they, at least yeah, they should uh, have, like, you know, used some kind of treatment from experts. And if that didn't work, then they should, tr- you know, find another solution through court, you know? Yeah, I think uh, at least... You know, recent and more recent studies, I think one of the ways I believe, so don't hold me to this. I, I This is something I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. But I believe what they try to do with people who have like that sexual sadism disorder is kind of like a dissociative effect where they're trying to get them to not associate pleasure with. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 you know, yeah, yeah. They also do that for so pedophiles. Like there, I know, like, there's studies into that. The same way that the similar, it's a similar research approach to, you know, pedophilia, not mm. getting them to associate certain feelings with certain, you know, this groups so, of yeah, kids. Yeah, okay. It's a, yeah, it's a similar kind of approach. Um, at least the last, I believe that's the last thing I remember. Obviously, they're exploring other avenues. Of but course, yes. That's one of the ways in which you're kind of studying that. But either way. Uh, let us know what you thought about this case. It's even though it's pretty straightforward in terms of, you know, 
someone who is classified as a you know serial killer, sexual sadist, and then just went forward and was doing very horrible things. Uh, for the most part, it's just another case of how the criminal justice system in a country just needs to be improved. Yes. And this is something we should all strive to Consider work for, like, for whatever country you're mm-hmm. in. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, just let us know what you think on the social media, the comments and all that jazz uh, about this case or any similar cases or your opinions about, you know, the criminal justice system and the approach of, you know, whatever country you may live in. Let us know. And, uh, you know, I guess to end things on a super duper, duper positive note, I guess any food ideas. You know what? I have a food idea because, you know, I always let you go and give yours first. So, uh, okay, go ahead. I'm really feeling some nice braised beef, you know, just, you know, stir fry some of the onions and garlic and pepper in the pan and then sear the beef and, you know, just flip it and then get some nice chicken broth and some Mm. nice, uh, yeah. You know, some nice cooking wine, cook it, let it sit in the oven, get it real nice and tender. And I'm basically giving you the recipe right now, essentially how I'm describing <laughs> it. But it's delicious, wonderful, especially when it thickens up and it turns into like a nice gravy in the mm-hmm. pot. You can throw that on some nice white rice. Ooh, that's Oof. good. Yeah. I can make that on Monday. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> That's good. I think, yeah, we're going to do that. By the time you're hearing this episode, it will probably be made already. So, uh, will it? Uh, no, no, no. not yet. It will be made later that day. So, uh, either way, that's something y'all should look up the recipe for. Braised beef, especially nice southern or creole braised beef. Mm-hmm. Ah, chef's kiss. Chef's kiss. But, you know. I, I, I actually had day. something else in mind, but after you said that, uh, that's my, like, now it that's in my head right now so (laughs) so I hope that image was a nice way to end things for you guys as it was for me and uh, let me know how you feel and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and I hope you stay safe stay healthy make sure your family stay safe stay healthy pay attention keep your eyes open and we will see you all uh, next week peace out okay bye see you next week